Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Cokesbury Church. My name is Stephen. I'm the senior pastor here. And if this is your first time with us, we're glad that you're here. If it's your first time back in a long time, it's good to see you. Or if you're here every weekend, man, welcome. We're glad that you guys are here. This is an incredible day to be alive, amen? Uh, what a beautiful day God has given us. I'm grateful for those of you that are here. You're, we've got folks in overflow. We've got a lot of people watching us online. I'm just grateful that we have a chance to share this moment together. I wanna to say thanks um, to some folks. Um, our staff, uh, we started this morning with a sunrise service out in the parking lot. A lot of them were here um, a little bit before five this morning. They've worked really hard over the past few weeks to get our facility ready and to, and to be prepared for you guys. So I wanna say thanks to our staff. We've got a huge team of volunteers who've taken time out of their weekend to be away from their family, to be here um, to make sure that, that we were ready to welcome you guys here. And so I can't thank our volunteers enough. You guys are just awesome. And there's one in particular that um, I cannot bring on the stage, but I wanna point her out. Um, straight back from me on the camera is Channa, and a lot of you guys know her if you're a regular part of our church. She is deeply involved in the mission and ministry of our church. She runs cameras, she works with students and children, and just is 
is just an unbelievable um, volunteer for us. And today she's gonna join the church and she's gonna do it from her camera though, which I know is a little weird. Normally I would ask folks, you know, to come up. And, um, you know, we, we always ask people if they'll support, who wanna join our church, feel support, coax, Mary with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. And I almost feel weird asking her that because she has been serving here so long and has made such a huge impact. And so, Chan, if you would, just give me a thumbs up. Yep, perfect, love it, welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> you know, it does not um, slip past me how um, different I think today is, especially for people who don't understand why we're gathering together. The fact that 2,000 years later, we're having a conversation about Jesus of Nazareth and we're talking about a man who walked the earth, who while he was here made these claims that he was God living among us in flesh and blood. And then he foreshadowed that the end of the story was gonna be radically different than every other story that's ever been written. That he would become a sacrifice for every single human being and that it would all be done in the name of love. You guys know as well as I do and love is an incredibly powerful force. In fact, if some species one day, I think, decides to write the story of humanity, I think that they'll look at all of our insanity and all of our violence and all of our disappointments and all of our brokenness, and I think they're gonna be able to look at us and say that they did it all because they were trying to be loved. And that then makes sense of why God did what he did the way that he did it. People ask, well, if God is for us, then why did it have to happen this way? Like, why step into human history? Why take on flesh and blood? Why walk among us? Why become Jesus? Why allow yourself to be brutalized, to suffer the way that he did? And why would you allow yourself to be crucified? See, when you understand that the love language of God is love itself, then you realize that the highest expression of love is always sacrifice. There's this moment in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. It's after the crucifixion of Jesus, but it's before they fully understood what had just happened. And this particular story is written by a disciple of Jesus who had left everything to follow him. And what's unique about this particular storyteller is he never actually tells you who he is. Like he'll refer to the other disciples, right? So if he's telling a story about Peter, he'll call him Peter. Or if it's Matthew or Andrew or one of the other disciples, but he will not ever name himself. He'll just say, the disciple that Jesus loves. That must have been really irritating for the other disciples, right? Like, of course Jesus loved them all, but he loved me a little bit more. He writes this in John chapter 20, beginning in verse one. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the, temp to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one who Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. Now I want you to notice that immediately the conclusion that Mary comes to is that they must have stolen Jesus' body because nobody could imagine that he was actually alive. Not even the ones who were closest to him, not even the ones who'd left everything and actually believed in him, not even the ones who had banked and bet the whole farm and put all of their hopes in him. Nobody could believe he was alive. That's why so many people started saying things like, well, this has to be a fabricated story, or, or um, this has to be some story that they constructed in a back room somewhere, or a lot of people just thought, well, they've gotta be telling a lie because they don't know what else to do. Like, they've all paraded around for the last three years saying that this is the Messiah that we've all been waiting on, and then they all watched him die on a cross, and so they just could not believe and so maybe they were lying. Well, the problem was they could not think up a lie like this. And so instead of assuming 
that Jesus had risen from the dead, instead of believing the words that he said, instead of remembering all the times that Jesus had actually told them, this is exactly what's going to happen. I'm gonna be offered up as a sacrifice for everybody. You're gonna watch me die, but don't panic. Three days, it's gonna seem like an eternity, but I'm gonna conquer death. Over and over he would tell them that, and yet they did not get it, and so Mary just assumed, well, they had to steal the body. We don't know where they put him. And the truth is nobody put him anywhere because he wasn't there. <laughs> they just didn't know that yet. Verse three, so Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Is that a really important detail? Don't you just love John? It's almost his way of saying, you know what? I got the best of that dude. Like, I got there first and I want the world to know. Verse five. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there. Here it is. But he did not go in. So John gets there first, but he stops too soon. And he does not go in. Verse six. Then Simon Peter came along, maybe huffing and puffing. I don't know. Maybe he pulled a hammy along the way. <clears throat> came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. Now, I love that about Peter. There's just no hesitation. That's who Peter was. That's how he lived his life. If you know anything about Peter, he was always saying the wrong thing. If he thought it, he did it. One time he's like, Lord, I'll walk on water. And Jesus is like, sure, come on. And he's like, all right, let's go. And he jumps out of the boat. One time a Roman soldier comes and Peter grabs a sword, cuts off the guy's ear. And Jesus has to go pick up the ear and put it back on the guy and just sort of say, Peter, you gotta stop, right? Peter was always messing up. But this time, that impetuous passion actually worked in his favor. He could not keep up with John, but when John stopped, Peter kept running. John says, then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And by the way, you, you don't need grave clothes when you know you're gonna be resurrected. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. And you would think, right, that's the moment. Like he pumped the brakes, not really sure if he should go into the tomb. But then finally, because Peter did, he thought, well, I'll just go ahead and peek in. And he saw everything. And, and John himself says he saw and believed. It sounds like such a definitive statement. But then John adds one more sentence. He says, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. <clears throat> I wonder how many of us have come so close to the empty tomb that we've peeked inside and we've come close to the power of the resurrection, but it's just like we're on the outside looking in. It's almost as if we're there, but we've not actually crossed the line of faith where the resurrection of Jesus has changed our lives forever. We get fleeting moments of power. We get fleeting moments of grace. There are these moments in life where it feels like we're living beyond ourselves, but then just as quickly as we had that experience, we kind of drift back and we go back to the same rat race that everybody else might be running. It's like we see and we believe and we believe what we've seen, but we don't yet realize there's so much more that God has in store for us. Well, if that's you, like if you believe, but you have not been transformed, or if you believe, but your life has not been radically changed, if you believe, but it feels like most days you're just going through the motions and you're not really alive, 
then it may be that you're like John. You've gotten so close, but you have not yet stepped across the threshold. I think it would be a huge tragedy to get so close, but to not actually enter in. One of the things about life that I find interesting is that hindsight is always better than foresight, right? Like if you could go back at the end of your life and if you could record your entire story, you'd get everything right, right? Like there'd be no mistakes. You'd never get anything wrong because you're looking back and you're writing the story to completion. That's sort of what John is doing right here. He's writing about this moment at the resurrection, but he's not actually in the moment when he writes it. He's looking back. He's writing knowing what he did not know in that moment. And what you find is that just before the moment at the tomb in John chapter 13, when Jesus gathers his disciples for Passover, he writes this. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in this world, he loved them to the end. That's a powerful statement. He loved them till the end. See, John wants us to know that there is an endless love that is available to every single one of us. He loved them to the end. This is how John describes the last days and the last hours of Jesus' life. This is what John saw when he watched as Jesus was brutalized. This is the thought that he came to as he watched him being tormented and tortured, shamed and ridiculed. This is what John concluded when he watched Jesus carry the cross up the hill. This is what John understood when he saw Jesus allow himself to be crucified. The one thought that came to mind when he thought about Jesus taking his last breath and as his body was placed in the tomb is he loved them till the end. But what they did not know is that that end was actually just the beginning. They did not know that when they thought that the story was finished that it was actually just getting started. See, that's the power of the resurrection. God loves you and God loves me so much that he will love us to the end. That he'll love us to the end of ourselves, that he'll love us to the end of our struggle, that he'll love us to the very end of our strength where we get to that point where we say, you know what, I cannot do this alone. He will love you to the end of you so that he can begin again with you. That's the good news of Easter, that you get a fresh start. And for some of us, it may not be a first fresh start. It, we may be on our 100th fresh start. As long as you and I are waking up and we're drawing air into our lungs, there is hope and there is possibility. See, if Jesus' story had ended on the cross, he would have indeed loved them till the end but he rose again, which means love is more powerful than death. In other words, things like hate have an expiration date, but love is timeless and love is endless and love is eternal. And John believed that. And he went on to try to unwrap what Jesus did. He's very deliberate about pointing out the fact that everything Jesus did was motivated by and endured for love. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, he writes this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now, without saying something that seems too simplistic, I don't want you to lose the power of the simplicity of what John is saying. He wants us to know that real love comes from God and that God is love. If you're looking for love, if you're trying to figure out what love feels like or looks like, John's saying it's God. 
that literally everything that has ever come out of God is an expression of his love. If you think about it, the entire universe is a material reflection of God's love for the human race. And beyond the collective, it's a reflection of God's love for you. God never created anything that was not an expression of his love. He created the universe and the solar system out of love. He created the stars and the moon and the planets and the, the comets. He created this earth, the mountains, the rivers, the oceans. All of it is an expression of his love. And you and I should never be shocked that we were placed on a planet where the atmosphere itself is perfectly designed, no matter how bad we try to mess it up, to sustain human existence. Every single breath that we draw in, it's God's way of saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. Every time the sun rises, every time you hear a child's laugh, every time you hear the crack of a baseball bat, every time you wake up and your body actually works, it's God screaming from the heavens, this is how much I love you. And it is important for us to know this because no matter what you've heard about God, God is love. You know, I think we've done a great disservice by trying to speak on behalf of God. Because what we end up doing is we paint a picture where we start to think that God sees us through condemnation and judgment. Or maybe God sees us through our failures and our mistakes. Or that God sees us through this sort of distant, messed up lens. That's not a reflection of who God is. That's actually a reflection of us. John is saying something really, really powerful, that God is love. He goes on in verse nine. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into this world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. See, one of the things that God understands because he designed us is that if we don't have love, we don't have life. Like if we don't experience love, then we're really just a hollow shell of ourselves. In fact, you will end up spending your entire life trying to fill the vacuum that's supposed to be filled with love. And we'll do it in a lot of different ways. Some of us will chase after fame. Some of us will chase after success. Some of us will continue to fight, trying to get more power in our lives. And the reality is that's gonna leave you feeling empty. Everything else that you and I pursue in life is just an attempt to try to satisfy that longing deep down in our souls to know that we are loved. See, friends, this is the good news of Easter. You are deeply loved. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how far from God you feel like you've ran, you are deeply loved, that God is madly head over heels in love, not just with the human race, but with you right now where you are. And I know that can be hard for some of us to hear because we just don't believe it. There have been voices speaking into our heads year after year telling us that we're too messed up or we've done things that are too bad or we've spoken words that we're never gonna get back again. And yeah, God may love somebody else, but God can't possibly love you. That's what the empty tomb means. That if he overcame death, he can over, overcome anything that you and I are facing. You are deeply loved, and therefore, that means that you actually matter. That means that your life is not lived in vain, that you were not plopped on this earth to wander around for 80 some odd years if you're lucky, and then one day just die and go away. See, because of Easter, you are more than the sum of the mistakes that you have made. You are more than what your past says you are. You may not yet be who you need to be, but if you know Jesus, you sure ain't who you used to be, amen? See, <laughs> Easter reminds us that hate cannot win, and it feels like we live in a world right now that is marked by hate, but it has an expiration date. Easter reminds us that failure cannot define us, that death will never be able to stop us. It means that you and I can live free, that tomorrow really can be better than today. 
See, I think that those seven words that the angels spoke that day, those are the words that resound across human history. He is not here. He is alive. That's exactly what we need to hear. And so what it means is you can live with hope. I know our world feels tough right now. And I know some of us feel like our back's against the wall. And I know there are people, we're searching for answers and we're desperate to find what's missing. It's been there all along. It's the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. That's what gives us hope. See, that, that is the, the cornerstone of human history. That's what holds it all together. It's, it's the empty tomb, but it is not the penultimate moment. The penultimate moment still out there somewhere. When Jesus fulfills the final promise and steps back into our reality and everything gets set right. And on that day, there will be no more tears and there will be no more suffering and there won't be any more wars and nobody will be fighting cancer again and, and everybody, no one's gonna feel lost and feel like they don't have answers because we'll be in the presence of the living resurrected Jesus. And between that day and this day, all that God is asking is that we receive his love and we share that love with somebody else, that we cling with everything we got to the hope that we have in Jesus and we trust that God is gonna be there with us every step of the way. So if you're here today and you can identify with John and you know some stuff about Easter, but it feels like you've just sort of been, been peeking in the tomb. Then I wanna ask you to take that step across the line and allow God to change your life forever. It's very, very easy. All you've gotta do right now where you're sitting is just say, Jesus, come into my life. That's it. It's Jesus, come into my life. I, I don't want to stand on the outside looking in anymore. I need to tap into the power that you're offering me. There's not a better day to say yes to Jesus than this day right here. Because this is the only day you got. And I know it can be easy to say, well, I'll get to that someday, or wow, I really need to make that decision. Listen, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna ask you to close your eyes and raise your hand. You can do it right now, and nobody's even gonna know it. You just say, Jesus, come into my life. For those of us that have peeked in and actually walked into the tomb and we know the power of the resurrection, don't let today just be a holiday. Let it be a rally cry. People are all worried about, well, what's gonna happen now that the pandemic's over? It seems like nobody's going to church anymore. I don't know of a time in my lifetime that's a better time than right now to share the good news. There are people everywhere who are desperate for answers. And it just so happens you already know the answer. And so I hope that as we leave this place, that we'll be inspired to take the resurrection with us and that we'll ask God on a daily basis, Lord, would you just bring somebody my way? And would you speak through me so that they can experience you? That, friends, will change the world. And so as you leave today, leave with your heart full. Leave with your chin up and your chest sticking out a little bit. Leave with confidence knowing that even if your mama won't love you, God loves you. And that even if everybody else on the planet has lost their sense of hope, that doesn't mean you gotta leave with no hope. No, 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 no. We go back out there and we carry with us the power of the resurrection. And we believe that God's gonna change the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.